Hi folks, welcome to episode 63 of the Epochs of the Lotus Eaters. I'm joined by Bo, as always, and this episode we're going to be discussing the Saxon Dusk, the twilight of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. Uh, where did we leave off last time? Well, with the sort of the end of Athelstan. That was right, and everything was going quite well for the English. Yeah, yeah, so that's sort of one of the high water marks. In fact, they enjoy... It depends how much you want to, how much detail you want to go into, but you, they sort of enjoy a, a couple of generations there of not exactly peace. That would be an overstatement, but a very, very low ebb for the the, the, the Northmen, mm. the Vikings, the Danes. Mm. Um, so, in the few kings in between Athelstan and Ethelred the Unready, um, it's sort of, I suppose, in history you get that all the time when there's lots of events and actions and war. Mm. People are sort of brought out in sharper relief or we sort mm. of know more, they're remembered more. Mm. And in times of, for want of a better expression, more boring times, <laughs> less explosive times, yeah. um, the figures just don't really sort of come out as much. So there oh, are a few kings. Um, well, one thing to say about Athelstan actually is that he mm. seems to have been uh, possibly celibate. Uh, he doesn't seem to have married. Confirmed bachelor. Uh, yeah. Which is um, a bit... Well, it's not that weird. It's uh, it's one of two things, well, probably. It's, it's weird given his family right. history, right? Yeah. You know, the massive brood that and the House of Wessex has. And you're playing the game of a, of a hereditary monarchy. Yeah. Yeah, hereditary succession. So, you know, there must be people like Eth Ethelstan. Don't you need a boy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Could really do with half yeah. a dozen boys yeah, right yeah. now, to Just, be honest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or at least one. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a couple of things it could be. Possibly, although un unlikely, is that he was gay. For example, there was William Rufus, William II, who was famously hmm. a libertine and uh, refused to touch women, basically. It's Very extremely true. rare. What's <laughs> much more likely is, and it, there's quite a lot of examples of it, is someone who's just very extremely pious, really, yeah. really pious. Yeah. And they get to sort of middle age um, and they've sort of got it out of their system and they're just not interested. But have you, have you spoken to, say, modern historians who will interpret that as uh, homosexuality? Some would, some can. They, um, I hate this, where it's like, oh, well, you know, every everyone's gay these days, and so therefore, oh, a thousand years ago, this guy must have been gay. It's like, they're totally different people. They have a totally different mindset. Like, there are some people who commit to the church because they think it's spiritually necessary. Mm. Like, they literally, they spend their whole lives, like, they see the, the sins of the flesh as a form of temptation and a form of, like debasement mm. you know and so it's like they have considerations that you just don't understand but yeah they like it up the ass you know like that's, that's your yeah. that's your summary yeah you know, they're, like, they're weirdos yeah in the ancient mind uh, in the medieval mind yeah like any fornication is just devilry yeah that's the devil's work. Some, some of them thought that yeah L loads loads of people i mean um edward the confessor was mm. basically uh, a monk a celibate yeah. um uh, Kath uh, catherine of uh um henry the second's wife um uh, her first husband, the King of France, or Louis, was he Louis VII or something? Mm. He was basically celibate. He, just, he was just, um, uh, you're much more married to church. Of course, there's lots and lots of examples of it in for women. Yeah. When and you're sent off to a nunnery in your 20s, and that's it. You're expected. Yeah. And the, the, <laughs> one of the early popes had to issue a papal bull to instruct Christians to stop castrating themselves. Right. You know, it's like, okay, there's, there's something clearly like anti uh, physical contained in the doctrine, you know. And a lot of people took that very, very seriously. So Queen Elizabeth I was a virgin queen, yeah. apparently. Um, yeah, no, there's, there's <laughs> loads of things where, uh, where, there's, uh, where, uh, where modern historians will say, yeah. oh, they're probably gay. No, that's, that's their weirdness they're yeah. imprinting on it. Because when someone was gay, like William Rufus, William II. We knew about um, it. Yeah, the accounts will explicitly say it because it's so rare and yeah. weird and deviant yeah. to their mind. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any question that mm. Edward the Confessor or Athelstan were gay, but well, I mean, they didn't have didn't get married and have kids. Yeah, but some guys just like their hobbies, don't they? You know, your hobby <laughs> might be being a king or something, you know? Um, yeah, right. Uh, so we don't really know why, but when Athelstan died, as we, we had to, he, he wasn't that old. No. So the next two kings after him are actually his younger brothers or half-brothers. Right, right. Uh, more children, again, of, of uh, Edward the Elder. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, 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 so you got um, an Edmund the first, and then an Edred, hmm. the next two kings, um, and, and their of... younger brothers, right? Because they're just not 
Yeah, yeah. The, 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 there aren't sort of really interesting big battles with the Vikings or anything in this yeah. period. No, nothing dramatic, like you say, brings them out in sharp relief. Mm. Uh, although we've been saying in the last couple of uh, epochs about how you've got these three kings in a row, Alfred the Great, mm. Edward the Elder and Athelstan. Some say, in fact, I'll read a quote in a minute, where they say some sort of attribute the next two as well. They're not as important, but they're sort mm. of part of this block of kings, mm. if you like, that all mm. that none of them do really badly against. Yeah. For a few hundred years, England was fairly safe. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And then there's and then there's a, there's an Edwig and an Edgar the Peaceful. I mean, that gives you an idea, doesn't it? Edgar the Peaceful. You can't. They have the option of being right. the peaceful. It's quite nice. Right. Yeah. Alfred would have loved that. <laughs> yeah. <you know? laughs> yeah. I think lots of kings would yeah. uh, love to have lived in an age when you were. Uh, yeah, you had the opportunity even to. Yeah. Get some of that. Next one's Edward the Martyr. So Edward the, Edgar the Peaceful and Edward the Martyr, sort of the direct predecessors before uh, Ethelred, mm -hmm. who is famously the Unready. We'll get into all that in a minute yeah. about all, what all that means. Um, but so they were in those last two before Ethelred, Edgar the Peaceful and Edgar the Martyr. The Viking or the, the incursions of the Danes sort of begin again. They sort of start to begin again. Mm. Um, and one thing to say, I suppose, when you've got this sort of overview, sort of fairly high level overview, and you can see the ebb and flow of how well the Vikings are doing in yeah. England, um, the last great push, the one that sees Swain Falkbeard and Canute become kings of England, um, it's sort of like a swan song, really. It's sort of like um, the graph if you like, is going down, 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 and then just there's this great blip that goes straight back up mm. again. And then really quite quickly after that, it falls off a cliff and they're yeah. sort of well, until, never come until, back. So it's this last Well, big until Harold Haldrada, right. incidentally, who, who we should cover in an epos. He's great. <laughs> uh, he's a really fun character. Um, but yeah, but that then, then that's it, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it's like... Hmm. As I think I mentioned in one of the last ones as well, there are still sort of Viking scares mm. all the way into the age of... Henry the Second, but yeah, after Harold yeah. uh, beats his own brother at Stamford Bridge uh, in 1066, that's the last Viking battle we have. Yeah, in that one at Stamford Bridge. But mm -hmm. like I say, the scares still go on for quite a while. You yeah, know, yeah. hundred years or more. Yeah. Um, so anyway, let's get back to this because mm. uh, Ethelred is sort of uh, you know a, a key one because his reign's really long, thirty five mm -hmm. plus years. Yeah. And there's all sorts of ups and downs and reversals and interesting things happen in it. So again, it's sort of like this figure jumps out. There's like a lull of historical interest, yeah. if you like, in the 10th century until you get uh, Ethelred mm -hmm. and then things sort of pick up. And the accounts um, of, sort of, well, the, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is the main one. And again, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is so... Um, um, fickle in what it decides it's going to talk about. Yeah. So, but it, it gives it gives us a fair bit about Ethelred the Unready in his right, reign. Okay. So, just from our literary point of view, we actually sort of, have something. We've got stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's good. Um, all right, then. So, I huh. thought perhaps I could just read out sort of a bit of an overview uh, paragraph just from Churchill. Yeah. Um, I should be moving on from uh, Churchill after we uh, finish up with sort of the birth of Britain phase, because I do think that his river war. And the birth of Britain, i.e. the very earliest kings, mm. are his best works. Right, right. Um, I really do think that. Or, or, or most well-written. Mm. Um, you could argue that his World War II stuff has sort of got more academic rigour. I mean, he was there for it. Oh, right. So. It's good and bad, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. He's really base, uh, biased because he was in it, but also yeah. it's, it's brilliant because he was in it. It's, yeah, you, it's you, a first-person account. Yeah, so. which is good and bad, isn't it? Yeah, for exactly. different reasons from, from our point of view as yeah. a historian. Um, anyway... Um, Churchill says this, quote, historians select the year 954 as the end of the first great episode of the Viking history of England. 120 years had passed since the impact of the Vikings had smitten the island. For 40 years, English Christian society had struggled for life. For 80 years, five warrior kings, Alfred, Edward, Athelstan, Edmund and Edred, defeated the invaders. The English rule was now restored, though in a form changed by the passage of time over the whole country. Yet underneath it, there had grown up a deeply root there had grown up deeply rooted in the soil a Danish settlement covering the great eastern plain in which Danish blood and Danish customs survived under the authority of the English king. End quote. 
So maybe say someone like Athelstan mm. sort of, you know, militarily boots them out of York and things. Well, that's only part of the story, isn't it, really? Yeah, the colonists are uh, still there. Yeah. And, um, you know, their, their, their culture and language and things. You don't just mm. wipe it out in one day or ever, really. There's a reason that Geordie Land has got such a strange culture, <laughs> a strange, strange accent. And I've seen I've seen uh, um, research done on place names, mm. and um, it's it's York, pretty clear. Wasn't York Jorvik. Jorvik, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the Romans called it Iboricum. The Vikings yeah. called it Jorvik, and now it's called, called York, York because it comes from the Danish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, and you can see, I believe, also in a lot of uh, sort of DNA sort of research. Mm. Yeah, you can see the people, yeah. people of Northumbria, people north of the Humber. Um, it just got much more, just as a percentage, mm-hmm. much more Viking blood in them. Um, okay, I think I'll do another uh, quote just to just get, jump ahead, basically, to, mm. to Ethelred and the interesting things that happen in his life and times. Um, uh, we're told, It must have seemed to contemporaries that with the magnificent coronation at Bath in 973, that's of uh, Edgar the uh, Peaceful, um, on which all coronation orders since have been based. That's interesting, isn't it? They still do it basically the same to this day. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, sort right, of okay. basically the same, largely. Hmm. Um, uh, the seal was set on the unity of the realm. Everywhere everywhere the courts are sitting regularly. He slips into present tense here. Hmm. Uh, anyway, the courts, uh, everywhere the courts are sitting regularly. In Shire and Borough and Hundred, there is one coinage and one system of weights and measures. The arts of building and decoration are reviving. Learning begins to flourish again in the church. There is a literary language, a king's English, which all educated men write. Civilization had been restored to the island. But now the political fabric which nurtured it was about to be overthrown. Hitherto strong men armed had kept the house, or the royal house. Yeah. Now a child, a weakling, a vacillator, a faithless, feckless creature <laughs> succeeded to the warrior throne. Tell us how you really feel. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, 25 years of peace lapped the land and the English, so magnificent in stress and danger, so invincible under valiant leadership, relaxed under its softening influences. Uh, we have reached the days of Ethelred the Unready, but this expression, which conveys a truth, means literally Ethelred the Ill-Counselled or Ethelred the Readless, end quote. See, and the, the joke of this is that Ethelred means wise counsel. So, uh, you know, wise counsel, the uncounseled or the poorly counseled mm. is the old joke. <laughs> so why was he poorly counseled? Well, um, apparently he uh, picked lots of advisors around him right. that nobody liked. Or right. his policies for pretty much most of his 35 plus year long mm-hmm. reign were unpopular and uh, ineffective. Yeah. So as I understand it, Viking raiders came, and Ethelred didn't destroy them. Mm. Why? Uh, well, he's a vacillator and a weakling. Uh, no, we'll say <laughs> there's lots of reasons. We'll get right. into it. But one of the main ones is, um, I suppose, the key thing, the absolute key thing, is that he seemed to be unable to act decisively. In fact, there's a quote right at the very end, I've saved to the end, right. by a great historian, Michael Wood, who I'm a massive fan of. Um he says, yeah, he's unable to act decisively when the moment called. Do you remember when we were talking about Athelstan and how he realised that yeah, this yeah. is the moment to attack York? Yeah. And he, he grasped the nettle. Yeah. Uh, Ethelred the Unready seems to have been right. unable, un- whether he's unable to see that this is the right moment or whether he didn't have the guts to grasp it when it yeah. came. Maybe both. Right. Um, something so like that. Because that's a shame because, I mean, England must have been relatively strong at this point. You know, and very must, rich. Yeah, very rich. He must have been able to raise, you know, a good number of men. Like, yeah. the, the, like at this point, it's had what 150 years of success. There's yeah, no, well, maybe too much, right? Well, possibly, but I mean, you know, you'd think that after, and it, it seems that the the previous kings had managed the realm well. Mm. So you'd think that the kingdom would be, you know, full of resources, full of men who could be called up to war, full of, you know, vim and uh, to defend itself. Surely, <laughs> you know, you you would have thought this would have been the best position you could have asked for, really. Well, yeah. The only thing I can say is what Churchill just said there about how we'd we'd been made soft yes, by I a few generations yeah. of yeah. not needing to fight. Yeah. Um, as I think we're realising now, it only yeah. takes really one or two generations. Yeah. Two generations between sort of, you know, like the greatest generation, yeah. the yeah. one World War Two. Yeah. That were really, really quite stoic. To be fair. Oh yeah. Um, and now 
our generations are the generation younger than us. <laughs> yeah, complete. We've been conquered. Yeah. Let's be let's Com- be real. Complete. Yeah. Weaklings. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Okay. And I, I, um, I'm guessing that the Danes were like, have you noticed that the English have become weak and soft and rich? Yeah. Mm. And uh, they keep refilling up the churches and cathedrals for us <laughs> to steal all, all the money out of, just like the old days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just yeah. like the Lindisfarne days yeah. hundreds of years ago. They keep doing that, yeah. And, um, well, churches, there's another one later, I'll probably end up reading it out, but he says how... Um, Alfred had used the sword and Dane Guild mm. in unison, whereas if the red seems to just be using Dane Guild. But yeah, why didn't he read? Because there are other accounts and other bits in the Anglo Saxon Chronicle and other uh, evidence yeah. where he did at various points sort of raise armies and he was marshalling, he was mustering men and he was printing coins in sort of the martial mm. mould and a couple of bits and a couple of times here and there, there are engagements, and he isn't a complete loser right, on the right. field. But it's just, I think he would have. Ne- I think he would have needed to have been. This is just sort of my opinion here, a bit of a yeah, brand. Yeah. He would need to have been an Alexander type figure or Caesar, where you're just constantly, constantly, year after year after year after year, campaigning mm. and nearly always smashing it, nearly always dominating. Yeah, yeah. I think he would have needed to have been like that, and he just wasn't. He, you know, he wasn't well. a complete. Um, like Henry the Sixth, hmm. sort of nothing of a person. Um, but he just wasn't the man for the job. Yeah, he just doesn't right. seem to have been up to it, right? Whatever it was. Um, okay, so, so yeah, the, it, how long is it from when he's crowned that the Danes realise? Oh wait, uh, England's weak again. We can go over and start plundering. It's pretty much straight away. I mean, oh. it's even it's even started to happen before. Ethelred even um, oh, really? gets to the throne, so it's just started, right. but it all ramps up quite quickly during his lifetime. Right. Um, and as I say, his, his, his reign is long, and he comes to the throne fairly young, you yeah. know, not, a, not a boy, not a child, but a young, very young man, um, and it's just a whole time for him. So I also feel like sometimes you get this in history, don't you, where you're just born into the right or the wrong time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Circumstances can essentially conspire against you or in favour of you, uh, you know, so. Yeah, like if you were a, a great military, a true military genius, but you were born in Byzantium in eighteen in 1420. Yeah, yeah, you've not got much hope. Yeah, you've got no, yeah. you've got no hope of going down yeah. in history as a Benazarius. Yeah. It's not yeah. going to happen for you. No. Right? Um, and, I mean, if Alexander was born 100 years earlier, he wouldn't have overthrown the Persian Empire. Right. You know, it's yeah. just, it wouldn't have happened. Right. He probably would have done other interesting things, but it wouldn't have been that. You know, yeah, yeah. If Julius Caesar was born two hundred years earlier, he almost yeah. certainly wouldn't have ended up sort of dominating history. The way or a hundred years later, right? Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Like, you, you'd have just been a courtier. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah. You got to be lucky. I feel like Ethelred's time mm. is a really tough time. It's a really hard time. Mm. I say, short of being somebody like Alfred the Great, mm. but he also didn't, struggle. He didn't really help himself, did he? Because <laughs> Like as I as I understand it, the the Danes begin invading again, and rather than constantly raising armies and fighting them, whether you win or lose, like I think even if even if you were to lose, it would still show the Danes, oh my god, they're still fighting us. You know, this is still difficult. Are we sure we want to go there? Can we not go to Ireland or somewhere else? You know, but instead he begins paying them off, mm. and I mean that just doesn't work. Mm. If you pay the invaders to go away, they go away with loads of gold. And then when they get back there, everyone's like, where'd you get that gold? Mm-hmm. It's like, they paid me to leave. Well, why don't you go over there? Well, I think I might. Yeah. And the lo and behold, you get more and more. It's actually, a, it's actually a magnet for more invaders to give them free money. Yeah. It's almost like that was a lesson mm. the conservatives should have learned. Mm. Sorry, I won't, uh, yeah. won't politicise this. Let's carry on. Yeah, no, the parallels are... It's Insufferable, there, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so false economy. Um, the only time when you might be able to make the argument that it's worthwhile doing is exactly what Alfred did, just to buy you enough time yeah. to raise your own army. Yeah. That's then the, maybe. Yeah. But, uh, it, it but other than that... It can't be a, a settled policy, right. mm-hmm. you know, that you use for 35 years. That's, that's not going to work. And it's loads of money. Like, at yeah. one point, it's like £14,000... At one point, it's like thirty odd thousand pounds. Towards the end, it was like a forty thousand. Yeah. This is forty thousand pound in weight yeah, 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 of yeah. silver, so yeah. it's millions of coins. Yeah, 
And it's just like, you could have raised a really big army for that. Yeah. You know, you yeah. could have literally have conscripted every man in England, you know, and paid them for a year's campaign with all mm. of this money. Mm. And you just give it to the Vikings. It would be better to have it paid in blood, you know, frankly. Mm. That's my opinion of it. You know, if mm. you're going to raise loads of money and give it to the enemy, you give it to them via the sword, you know, that you've paid for. <laughs> More than I know. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Uh, so, I mean, uh, he gets in, he's in 978. Hmm. Uh, and so sort of the 980s are a decade where it all just all starts coming back. It must seem a bit like a nightmare. Um, It's like we thought that Alfred and Athelstan had Mm. sort of put an end to this, these these heathen uh, adventurers, Uh, but it's sort of, you know, Mm. as you say, they must just realise it's a whole new generation of those guys as well. Yeah. And they must realise, oh, it is like the... Our forefathers told us it's just like yeah. it's just just sitting there waiting to be raided again. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're told in 980 serious raids began again. Uh, Chester was ravaged from Ireland. The people of Southampton were massacred by marauders from Scandinavia and Denmark. Apparently, the South Coast got it really quite bad. Mm. Um, Thanet, Cornwall, and Devon all suffered butchery and pillage. Uh, we have an epic poem upon the Battle of Malden. Uh, fought in 991, actually, just before we go on to the Battle of I, I have read this poem. Oh, really? Oh, yes, I've studied it. And um, it's really insufferable. <laughs> it's it, like the... It's really disappointing that the English are so dumb as to allow themselves to have an appeal to fairness made mm. by a bunch of bloody pirates. Mm. Like these evil men who are just here to kill you uh, essentially, so what happens is the some English earl at Malden raises his uh, house guard and a feared and goes out to meet a large band of Viking marauders, and he outfoxes them, and he's got them across a river, and they need to get across this river, across one bridge, and he's on the other side of the bridge, and they obviously can't go across because they'll get murdered, and so they say, well, wouldn't it be fair to let us cross and then draw up, and then we can have an honourable battle? It's like, you're not dealing with honourable men, yeah, you yeah. know, you you know, let them come across one at a time and then kill them as they do, <laughs> but instead the Earl's like, yeah, yeah, I will do that, actually, and it's like, okay, and then essentially the battle just turns south immediately, mm-hmm. like he gets his arm cut off, his third run away, and his his thanes or the you know the house guard just get you know they 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 die to a man at his side bravely mm, heroically mm, stupidly mm. and there's a great line in it which is um something like let the let the eye be keener and the heart stronger with your diminishing might and it's like yeah okay that's all well and good to show that like you know you can have this kind of moral victory out of this defeat against the Danes, but wouldn't it have been better to have not been defeated by the Danes? Mm. You know, th- these these dishonourable men appealing to your sense of honour in order to have a, a, a shot at victory. And you don't have to be honourable with dishonourable men. Mm. In fact, it's not to your advantage to be honourable to dishonourable men, and it's only to their advantage, and you'll probably end up losing because they're dishonourable. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.